you are a person that can help uh, a family, an individual, a group of folks, um, it really draws people into you and it allows you to become the expert for the community, not just for that one person, because as you help people beyond just their Medicare needs, it really helps them to spread your name around. You know, Carl Judd, man, he, he helped me in my situation. And I tell you what, if you really need any help, whether it's Medicare or anything else, um, you should get a hold of him. And so that has been my experience. I think you guys, as you continue in this path, so today we're going to jump into that. We're going to talk about three specific areas um, on the financial aid side. That will come from and other systems. It's about programs. Um, one thing you probably will recognize from uh, your training, either in your certifications or possibly from a when talk about AS, up, also referred to as extra help. That is done. Okay, Glenn, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Okay, thank you. And, uh, I don't know what I'm happened there, for but about 20 I seconds. off for a second. Yeah. <laughs> so I apologize. Um, okay, so as I was saying, one of the programs that you will um, recognize, hopefully, is LIS, which is Low Income Subsidy. It's also referred to as Extra Help. Um, you will recognize that from going through DNIT and dual eligible training. Extra help is the very first level of assistance that um, any Medicare member can, can reach. And what extra help does is it, it discounts and gives assistance to drug coverage uh, and really just the drug coverage. There are a couple different levels within extra help, uh, but um, the extra help program is designed to make seniors to not go without drug coverage and, and incur a, a penalty going forward. So the extra uh, program is done through ssa.gov. Um, I can throw that into the chat so you guys have that website. There is a nice little link there that says for extra help. <laughs> so uh, you can go right through the online portal with the client and do it right there with them. Um, that helps the client, but it also helps you. One of the things that's nice about the LIS program is it generates its own uh, special election period. So I know we're in annual enrollment right now, but extra help not only lowers their drug coverage, cost, but it also generates a um, special election period for anybody on Medicare. So keeping that in your back pocket as we get into the next year um, and you meet clients and you're thinking to yourself, well, open enrollment's not open. Well, if you can apply for the extra help and get them qualified for it, once they get that approval letter, they're eligible to sign up for any kind of uh, product that has drug coverage, whether that be standalone drug coverage or a Medicare Advantage plan that has drug coverage included. Um, so I highly recommend if, if a client has not applied for it and you think they may qualify to go ahead and throw an application in. Um, one, it'll 
do them a, a great service. And two, it'll help you to lock in that client and possibly offer them some other um, product options that wouldn't be available. The other thing, or the last thing I would mention about extra help is that when you're looking at drug coverage through a Medicare Advantage plan, you'll find uh, somewhere in the drug coverage area where it talks about the different levels of coverage. So if we go back to page four of my training, or if you look in any of the uh, Medicare Advantage book, or even online, catastrophic coverage, LIS automatically put them to the catastrophic coverage level. So the cost for, uh, and it might be my internet, but <laughs> so I apologize if it's my best to push um, I asked it to the cattle to begin. So, um, if you guys can get them qualified for extra help, um, what you will be doing is. referring to the capital for their drug cover. Their regular copays do not apply and there uh, will not be double or gap in their coverage. Everybody, I, I understand breaking up. I'm not sure that I have a way to fix it any more than I have. So um, if this comes out too bad, uh, I probably will reward the audio, but um, please bear with me as I try to get through this. <laughs> um, Okay, so another federal program, um, and this is actually available through both state and federal, is the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, you'll see at the bottom of this slide, and this, this whole PowerPoint will be available on the LBA website. Um, actually, it's there now. Um, you can click into this link, and it gives you access to all these programs. So the SNAP program, um, that is money that's given for food. Uh, the, there's also the housing choice voucher program. Those are for 65 and older that needs assistance with housing. Uh, PACE is something that I actually very rarely help people with because once you sign somebody up for PACE, you're looking at turning that client over to this program and what will end up happening will be constitutionalized and not have a need for a regular advantage and or um, settlement. What we'll have um, and what normally happens is they will get what they call institutional medication, and which most of you are not able to stop. So I keep PACE there as a last resort because we always wanna do what's right for the client, even if it's not in our best for, uh, interest, but it is a program for somebody who's in dire straits that you can push to and help them uh, it, to fix those emergency needs. And then you have LIHEAP, uh, that's Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. That's basically to keep the gas lights uh, the essentials in the home on. And again, all those programs can be found at this, um, that, this link here. So you're able to go ahead and once this, uh, this training is done, you can go back into this PowerPoint, which is in the LBA website, and you can look through this yourself to see if those programs are anything that your clients need. So as far as state programs, um, Medicaid is a big one. Um, if you have not been in the LBA website in the last 24 hours, I have loaded uh, state assistant programs for every state that offers them in the website. So for example, I know Glenn, you're in Georgia. Uh, you can go into the website, you can click into that and you can see all the state programs that are available um, for the whole state of Georgia. Uh, California is in there and California is actually kind of special. The link that I put in there actually shows you what counties 
um, have different benefits to them as well. So highly encourage all of you to look through those, especially for the state or states that you are gonna be working in so that you can understand some of the state assistance programs that are available. Now, Medicaid is probably my top used um, a program that I go to. Medicaid is what uh, makes a client eligible for the dual uh, Medicare Medicaid plans. And so if you're familiar with those, most of those programs do not have any cost for services unless it's like dental or um, possibly acupuncture, things like that. But their medical benefits are normally taken care of at 100%. So Medicaid is going to be one of those things, if you find a client that qualifies for it, that you will want to try to actively pursue them getting eligible for, because it offers them such a huge benefit to join a dual eligible plan. Um, for Florida, I know that, and this may be true for other states, I'm not sure, I'll have to do a little more research. For Florida, um, as a, an agent, I can actually set up an account to be an overseer, so, so to speak. Um, I can go in and I can create my own account, which I have done. I can help people do their um, applications and then I can also monitor those applications to see if they're approved, if they need other documentation sent into the state and what have you. Um, I'm not sure if other states are set up that way, but I will do some research, especially with some of the states that we have larger agent populations and give you guys some feedback on that uh, through the LBA website. I'll just generate a post and let you guys know what I find out on that. But Medicaid is a huge benefit. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a slide or two, but um, just keep in mind for right now, Medicaid is probably your number one resource when it comes to your Medicare beneficiaries and how it will help them, especially as expand their options for products and to lower their cost overall. Another, um, program or I guess facilities that I look to are senior centers. Um, now, if you look at um, the Council on Aging, which is usually what they fall under, the Council on Aging is government funded centers that cater to 55 plus. Um, I usually build relationships with those centers by uh, doing a monthly birthday cake or maybe a pizza party or something like that to make sure they knew who I am. Uh, but I also go in there and I do monthly seminars to let them know the changes that have happened with Medicare, um, any of the other special things that's going on that would pertain to them. Um, a lot of times there will be local products, for example, Aetna um, may have a special um, department that caters specifically to helping seniors with getting, um, let's say, rails uh, for those that are disabled. And so I will go in and talk about special things like that just to keep them in the loop. And again, I always make sure they know what my job is. My job is to help people to work with their insurance and to get them aligned properly to their specific needs. So if any of them want to meet with me, um, we can do that right after I do my little presentation or I can set home appointments. I usually keep a huge stack of contact cards as well as business cards at the senior centers. So a senior center can be a great resource for you to generate leads, but senior centers is, are also places that I point seniors to, especially if they're new to an area, because what they do is they create a, a location that seniors can go to, they can gather with people that are their age, and they have lots of fun activities, they have lots of learning activities, and things just to keep seniors engaged with their community. 
<laughs> Again, we talked about the PACE program on the federal side. The, um, the PACE program is built really to take in a senior and bring them to the fruition of their life cycle. Um, usually people that go into PACE are going to be uh, financially uh, strapped uh, to, a, to a point that they will not recover and they do not have family or other resources to help them um, to be able to sustain living outside of an institution. The last program on the state side that I would highlight is Social Security uh, Income. Um, there are two different Social Security, um, well, there's three Social Security Incomes. There's SSI, which is a state benefit. It is for people who are uh, within the poverty level or lower. Then you have SSA, which is your normal retirement um, benefit. And then you have SSDI. SSDI is Social Security Disability Income. Disability income does not have a income threshold. Um, SSA does not have an income threshold, but SSI does have an income threshold and only people who fall within the poverty level will qualify for that. And it does fall at the state level. So if you have people that um, are lower income and they're um, in need of more financial assistance, it wouldn't be a bad idea to mention to them or maybe even help them to try to apply for SSI. Um, again, that can be done at ssa.gov. And um, it can be a very useful tool to help your clients. So we talked about Medicaid just a few minutes ago with the state benefits. This is an example, this is actually California, of how Medicaid is broken down. There are four levels of Medicaid Actually, there's five. One is not listed here, and I'll talk about that one in a second. But there are five levels of Medicaid. We'll start at the bottom and work our way up because um, it'll make more sense if we do it that way. On this slide, it shows uh, qualified disabled working individual. Um, you will not find many people who fall within this category. Uh, most people that fall within this, this category don't technically qualify for Medicaid. And so what will end up happening is they will receive a lot of benefit from the uh, QDWI. What they will get from that is the same as a QI1, which is the next level that we're going to talk about. QI1 is um, what states refer to as the Medicare Savings Program. Program takes the Part B premium for Medicare and it pays it for the individual. Uh, now it is a qualifier for Medicaid. So now we're going to get into a little bit more of the specifics about how to break down when we talk about what level of Medicaid. QI1, which is qualified individual, and SLMB, the specified low income Medicare beneficiary are considered partial Medicaid. That means they qualify for some help, but not enough to give them full Medicaid status. So <clears throat> when you're looking at plans, especially on the Medicare Advantage side, QI1 and SLMB will be plans that allow for partial Medicaid um, eligibility. Um, that gets a little tricky when you start looking at dual eligible plans because technically they are dual eligible, but as you reach through the front side of the eligibility for the plans, you have to make sure that they allow for either QI1 or SLMB for that dual eligible plan, or if they do, are there co-pays for the client? Because if, if, uh, if you don't 
recognize that you can think you're putting your client into a zero cost across the board plan as far as their copay structure, when in reality, they may have um, the regular 20% for their part B that they have to pay. And what they're getting in, in exchange for that is a higher amount of ancillary benefits. And what I mean by ancillary benefits would be dental, vision, transportation, and things like that, non-medical things. Um, so it's important to understand what these levels are. So QI1, SLMB, in the big scheme of things from our perspective, from, a, from an insurance perspective, what they do is they pay the Part B premium for the client, that 177, and then it makes them eligible for some plans. Now, I will say that anybody who qualifies for any of the three levels that I have just talked about will also qualify for LIS, that extra help from the federal level. So if you find somebody who falls within these pyramidal, parameters and they have not applied for their extra help, um, the next logical step is to go back and apply for their extra help as well. That way you can take care of both their drug coverage cost and their medical, medical cost, including their Part B premium all in one fell swoop. Now the last level is full Medicaid. Um, some states just call it QMB, some call it QMB plus, some will call it FBDE, which is full benefit dual eligible. Um, and FBDE plus. So depending on the state that you're in, um, and again, those links that uh, I have in the LBA website will kind of go into that if you want to go ahead and research some of that. Uh, but full Medicaid would be uh, people who are are pretty low income compared to their to their region. So for example, we see here in in um, in California a single person's income would have to be less than 1133 per month. Um, and that includes their social security. So whatever they have, their total income would have to be less than 1133 per month. And they also cannot have assets more than 7970. Um, an asset would be anything that is liquid, that is not their personal vehicle and their personal home. They're allowed to have those two things, but outside of that, if they have a 401k, if they have a life insurance policy that has cash growth that they can liquidize or take a loan against, um, if they have a savings account, any of those things would be a, uh, an, a, an asset that would go against that asset limit. So you can see some of these numbers are pretty stringent when it comes to the areas that we're in. Uh, that, we, that we're helping clients with. So people who qualify for that are generally gonna be eligible for a Medicare Advantage plan that has no cost to it. The, the structure for that will be reflective of what their income is. And I'm going to leave it at that for now. I'm gonna also say at the end of this, we're gonna open up for questions. So I'm gonna leave this part for there. I'm sure there's gonna generate questions, but if you could just hold those to the end, that would be appreciated. <laughs> um, another resource that I like to use, and every state has their own version. I actually chose Florida to show you this one, but there are state discount cards or SPAPs, uh, State Pharmaceutical Assistant Programs. Um, this is one that I found just doing some research online. Florida Discount Drug Card, for those of you that are Florida agents, you can just go to Florida Discount Drug Card. This is the first site. You click up in a name um, and then it generates a discount card for you. What's nice about this as an agent is not only does it allow them to sometimes realize some discounts with their drugs, it also generates a special election period for you. So again, I know we're in open enrollment right now, and that's not necessarily the biggest thing that we need to focus on, but you will have clients that for some reason will need to make changes 
either you've helped them now or you're going to help them in the future and they don't have any other special election period that they can use. Well, this is one of those places where they can go ahead and get a special election period. So once you have that, um, what I tell my clients is go ahead and take a, uh, either a cell phone copy or a picture of some kind and then send you to that, uh, that information because it'll have an actual um, just like any other drug coverage, um, it'll have a membership number and then some other information that you will need when you're using that special election period. So um, what, I'll, what I'll say about that is it's nice to have these resources, both to help your client, but also to help you because as you are able to understand the bigger business and understand how to kind of circumvent um, or not circumvent, but um, stay in, in the rules of Medicare, but doing it in a way that most agents are not aware of, this is going to give you a status in your communities that is above all other agents. So for example, let's, let's turn back to one of the areas that I talked about with the senior centers. If you go into a senior center and you have somebody in the month of June who's struggling, they, they for some reason got put on a plan that's not beneficial to them. And they say, hey, Carl, um, gosh, you know, I, I joined this Medicare Advantage plan and uh, it started out great, but here I'm finding myself in a situation where I really need to get into this other plan. Okay, not a problem. Let's go ahead and sign you up for this <laughs> SPAP, this um, discount drug card. It generates a special election period. I can have you on a different plan the first of next month, no problem. So um, that, again, done, done in like a senior center setting, spreads like wildfire. You have become a person that can do something that no other agent has been able to do in their community. And that, that will really do great things for you as a Medicare agent. Medicare is a tough industry to begin with, right? The first year is definitely the hardest, but as you learn these tips and tricks, what I'm teaching you on the front side, um, you guys will be able to be very successful um, as you start working with your clients, and especially if you start working with different centers and, and um, facilities within your community. Okay, so moving on. Um, this is a look at um, the original link that I put uh, on, I believe it was the second slide. So it talks about what the different Medicaid um, names are by state. Uh, so again, if you wanted to click into that link, you can go in there and you can, especially uh, this is important if you're working um, in multiple states, right? If you're licensed in four or five states or 50 states and you want to help people outside of your original state, um, it's important to understand what and how Medicaid is and how it operates um, in different states because the rules are different for each state. So for example, in Alabama, you don't even see that there's an alternate name. <laughs> it's just called Medicaid, right? But in Alaska, it's Denali Care. In Arizona, it's this big old AHCCCS, right? And each of them function differently. The levels of Medicaid, the cost to get to those levels are different. And sometimes what is covered is different. So I highly encourage you to, um, to go there if you're working in alternate states. If you're working just in the one state that you are, um, that is your home residence, then that one link that I put into the LBA website would be sufficient. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so let's get to the to the meat of why we're doing this training today. Why I provide these services? Well, as I mentioned in in every training that I've done so far, Medicare is a relational based 
sale. And keeping your clients is definitely a relational based um, scenario. So as you can see, I'm trying to teach you guys how to have the edge above every other agent that's out there. Building relationships in the community, having access to things that most agents do not have, and then knowing the tips and tricks on how to help clients when other agents can't do those things. So if you are a full service agent, and keep in mind Medicaid, LIS, uh, SPAP, all those things, they're not in our job description as Medicare sales agents, but they are the things that tie your client into you in a way that um, your client is not going to want to leave you and it will help them to give you referrals. It will incentivize them because if you're helping them at that level, it will build a trust level between you and that client. They will want to extend to their friends and family. Um, <clears throat> already mentioned about triggering SEPs, a special election period. So a lot of the Medicaid, LIS, SPAP, um, those income-based criterions for those programs, once you're approved for any of those, they generate a special election period. Now that's important for a couple of reasons. One is you might find, matter of fact, I'll give you guys an example. I met with one of my clients this year. Um, he doesn't take any medicine. Um, he goes to one primary care physician, he has no specialist, and he really doesn't have any emergent needs. However, he's in his 80s. So one of the big factors that we looked at was making sure that if he had any emergency care, that it was covered at the lowest cost. So if he went into the hospital because he fell down, broke a leg, had a heart attack, a stroke, anything like that, that it would be the lowest cost possible. Um, outside of that, his only other needs were dental, vision, and um, let's see, dental, vision, uh, dental and vision. So we got that taken care of with one plan. But as a caveat to that, I said, look, you know, uh, the dental may or may not provide all of the things that you need because he needs a lower plate um, for his dentures. And it didn't specify that in the plan. So what I told the client is, you know, we can start this plan. It'll start January 1st. You can use the benefits that you need for the vision. Get yourself a pair of eyeglasses, get your testing and all that stuff done. Oh, the other thing was hearing. He needed uh, hearing aids as well. So go ahead and get your hearing aids. And then let's attempt to get your lower plate for the dental. Well, if we come to find out that he cannot get his lower place with a dental, I know that there are other plans that can do that. I can use an SEP to change his plan after the first of the year. So that is a great example of how knowing how to trigger an SEP can be valuable for your personal clients. And again, if you meet people outside of your own personal influence, that had told you, well, you know, I know it's not an annual enrollment. I can't make any changes. I've already talked to my agent. Um, and you can go back and still apply that change for them. You have now become a superstar in the Medicare world. And I can't tell you how much of an influence that has, not just with that client to be able to stay with you indefinitely, but for them to spread your name across their personal platforms. So highly recommend that you understand this part. And again, you know, I've made this into a PowerPoint specifically for you guys. And I put all those resources so that you guys can go to those anytime that you need those. Um, the MAPD plan elections, as you get them more and more benefits, um, LIS, you have to understand that it changes the drug coverage and what the cost is and explaining that to the client. So when they look at a plan and it says, well, a tier four drug is going to be a hundred dollar copay. If you understand that they have LIS and you look at their 
um, uh, catastrophic coverage, you'll realize that realistically, they're not going to pay more than $11 for that same drug that a normal client would have to pay a hundred dollar copay for. They also don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, the donut hole. <clears throat> now, when it comes into the Medicaid, like I was explaining earlier, you'll have some plans that allow you to have partial and full Medicaid members on them with no difference. You'll have some plans that um, require full Medicaid only. And then you have some plans that have a different cost structure for full Medicaid versus partial Medicaid. However, anyone with Medicaid can sign on to those plans. So um, the way to understand that is to get a good idea of, uh, let's see, I can't go back to that slide, but the, the slide that breaks down the, the four levels of Medicaid, which I know I mentioned five, I'm gonna talk about that one in just a second, uh, but understanding those levels of Medicaid and how that correlates to the plan that they may go into that you're going to recommend. Uh, referrals, you know, I touched on that already. And then really the biggest thing is because Medicare is such a relationship-based or a, um, really it's a uh, reputation-based um, kind of product, um, that is going to grow your reputation, you know, especially if you're working with more community partners. Um, I highly recommend talking to senior centers, uh, senior communities, um, any, anywhere that has large groupings of seniors to let them know um, a lot of the things that you can do for folks. Okay, so let's, let's talk about one more item and then I'm gonna open up for questions that you guys may have. I know I went through that pretty quick. Uh, so I mentioned that there are five levels of Medicaid. The fifth level of Medicaid is not very often discussed because it is a short-term fix. Um, it is called um, medically needy. And what medically needy is, is basically a, a 30 day window with a 60 day look back that allows a person who had a catastrophic event to apply for Medicaid to fix that event. So let me give you a little history on why that's important. <laughs> Um, what would happen uh, before all the states kind of got their Medicare and Medicaid um, to join forces and, and private insurance started to build plans around that is that people with lower income would take um, any illness. It wouldn't matter. It could be the cold and they would go to the emergency room. Now, we all know that a visit to the emergency room is going to be expensive. Uh, I think the minimum that you're going to walk out of an ER is about $3,000 if you have no insurance. And that's really just being looked at, getting your temperature taken, uh, blood cuff around your arm, and uh, a lozenge. <laughs> that's going to cost you $3,000 if you have no insurance. So if you, if you uh, kind of compare that to what the Medicaid requirements are, um, or their income, let's say somebody makes you know twelve hundred dollars a month and they get a three thousand dollar bill, uh, they clearly are not going to be able to pay that three thousand dollars in any um, comfortable time frame for for the facility. So what Medicaid created is medically needy. It's an event based or a monthly based event. Uh, that can be taken care of. Now, how it actually works is that entire month is taken care of. And then Medicaid will also look back for 60 days prior for any medically necessary um, services or prescriptions that, that were not covered 
and they'll go ahead and absorb those as well. So basically what Medicaid does is wipe out those large costs. The problem in the past was people who couldn't afford their drugs or couldn't afford to go to their specialists because um, you know, it was 20% and it was 65, 75, $85 for that visit, they would say, okay, on the first of the month, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the emergency room because I've got a sniffle. I'm gonna get my medically needy in place and then I'm gonna go ahead and see all my doctors and stuff for the rest of the month for no cost, get my medicines covered and Medicaid's gonna cover it. And then if I have to do it next month, I'll do the same thing. So they were month to month getting medically needy and it just made no sense. So medically needy is still available. However, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of programs and, and other resources out there right now that allows your clients not to have to go through that process so that they can get the services that they need and um, it doesn't affect the overall hospital cost and it doesn't bleed out the Medicaid dollars that are available to the entire state. So with that, I think that's probably a great place to open it up for questions that you guys may have on this topic or anything that I've covered up to this point. I have a question. Okay. Um, earlier you were talking about, um, as far as the cost of uh, the Medicare insurance in conjunction with someone that had life insurance. So um, it, am I understanding right, like the, if they have a cash value life insurance policy that, that affects what they would uh, get approved for for Medicaid? Is that what you're saying? For Medicaid, yes. For so Medicaid me, or Medicare? Not Medicare. So Medicare, they have, they have uh, in all intents and purposes, they have earned. Uh, once they have gotten their 40 quarters uh, of tax, tax paid employment. So what I mean by that is um, 10 year equivalent, or what it really breaks down to is 40 quarters where they have paid into FICA taxes. Um, that is what qualifies them for Medicare. Um, or if they're disabled earlier than that, there, there's, there's some caveats to that, but basically the general rule of thumb is uh, if they have worked 40 quarters and paid taxes in for those 40 quarters, um, there's really nothing that, that can disqualify them for Medicare. Okay. Now, the Medicaid, um, that's a different story, <laughs> right? That is completely income-based. And the reason that I bring this particular things up is in the, in the Medicare community, you know, depending on where you live, um, you're going to find that anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of your Medicare clients are probably eligible for one of the things that we talked about today, whether it be extra help or the Medicare savings program, uh, which is um, the QI1 level. And that's a big deal. If you have somebody who's only making, let's say, uh, you know, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars a month. You're thinking at least half of that is probably rent. You've got utilities to figure out, and so just on a on a monthly basis, just for them to survive, they have spent most of that thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars. So to be able to recoup that hundred and seventy seven dollars back into their Social Security check is a is a big big deal for them. Um, that's, that's whether they can eat sometimes or not. I've literally had clients that have been uh, extremely grateful because I have actually put food on their table where they were going to have to go to a soup kitchen or something half of the month because they just didn't have any income to buy food with. Well, and that's because they didn't qualify for Medicaid? Uh, because they never uh, applied for it. Oh, they um, never so I went applied in and, for it. 
Right, so, but, right. So, so my question is, if they had a life insurance policy, like a, a cash value life insurance okay. policy, most likely they wouldn't qualify for Medicaid. Is, is that correct? Because well, they would have to exalt <laughs> that first, like out of their long-term care? Well, anything that's in excess of the asset limits technically is a liquid asset, right? So if you right. had a cash value of $300, um, that's not a big deal. If you had a cash value of $100,000, the state is going to say, well, okay, <laughs> I can appreciate that you're trying to have savings for this and that and the other. However, um, we have all these people over here that don't have what you have um, as mm -hmm. far as that cash value. And so we're going to ask right. that you deplete that down to the point where you're under the asset level and then wow. you apply for the assistance, right? Wow, okay then, understood. Thank you. Great question, thank you for that. What I other have a question. questions? Okay. I have a, um, what about a, guy, a person who is 66, has part A, this is from prior, prior webinars, has part A, wants to get on an Advantage plan but doesn't have part B and he's been eligible for a year. Okay. The and first what, question <laughs> that I'm going to have for that client is why do we not have part B in place? If it's okay. because they have had group coverage, that's not really an issue, right? Um, the, the time period where they come off of group coverage, they're eligible to join part B with no penalty, and then we can start looking at Medicare Advantage plans for them. Um, okay. If it's they have not had group coverage and they just said, well, shoot, I just couldn't afford that $170 a month or 140, whatever the cost was when they were looking to join, then it becomes more of a question of, have you applied for the Medicare savings program? which is the QI1 level that pays the Part B premium, right? And if you go into, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the state um, stuff that I posted in the LBA website, you can very quickly determine whether or not they would qualify for that or not. So what I do a lot of times is I will go in and apply for their Medicare savings program before um, we get their Part B back in place. Can I just say, and then can I say something? Ahead. Sure. It's not money. I know it's not going to be that. Okay. Um, so my question is, I don't actually know why. So first I have to ask why, but I know <laughs> sure. it's not money. Um and what if it's just I just didn't do it? But he's he's definitely not qualified for um you know, the lower income things is, sure. can I tell him just go get it now or what's going to happen? Well, hmm. it really depends on what the why is, right? Okay. If it's, I, I just, I, I don't go to the doctor. I didn't think I needed it. Um, he's going to have to wait for the next enrollment period because uh, Medicare Part B does have an enrollment period for those who are not aging in or do not have what's considered a special election period. Um, so you'd have to wait to the next election period for him to pick up his part B. And, that and would, then. Would that be um, the very one? You know, <laughs> I really don't have many clients that fall into that category. So I'm not sure. I want to say it's, January 1st through the March, that one, the end of March, the yeah, open. I think, yeah, I think that's it. Um, but the, the reality is if they have just kind of been like, well, I, I just wanted the hospital coverage. I don't see any doctors. Okay. Well, you're missing out a lot and you're putting yourself in pretty bad shape when it comes to drugs if you ever need to take drugs because every month that you don't have part B and part D 
both of those are starting to accumulate a penalty. Right. And so when you really do need it, you're going to have penalties um, that are far beyond what you want to pay. And what we could do right now is put you onto a plan that offers both probably at no or very, very little cost. Yeah, he wants it. He wants to get on it. I just wasn't sure uh, because he doesn't have part B what to tell him. Gotcha. But I, I will just first ask that first question. Okay. Well, like if, it, if, it's a, if it's not a financial thing, <clears throat> I, would, I would see if he had group coverage and when it, when it ended, and if that's not the case, then um, I would just brace him that he's probably going to have penalties to sign up for his Part B. Mm -hmm. um, but once he gets his Part B in place, you know, beyond the penalties, um, it'll be very inexpensive for him. Right. Yeah. Okay. I did read in the training one place where it said on Part B, it's the penalty kicks in after two years. Like he's one year out from when he could have signed up for Part B. Is gotcha. that true? It's two years to the penalty or? So you, you, you said 66 and I have to be careful, right? Because, you know, some people get Medicare before 65 uh, due to disability. Oh, so yeah. yeah, if you're, if you're beyond the second year, you, you would have penalty for the part B, uh, the Part D will have started oh, to accumulate once, um, well, let's just say 65 plus two months, <laughs> 63 days after his first possible eligible date, um, he'll start accruing penalties. Right. So he'll have a Part D penalty, but not necessarily a Part B penalty. Correct. Really, yeah. I, I try not to, the way that they equate the penalties is uh, well beyond what I have been able to figure out in 20 years. <laughs> so what honestly I would do is if, if you feel like he's going to have penalties, I would recommend uh, having him call Social Security and find out what penalties he does have because it'll all be right in his account they'll be able to look it up oh, okay. and um you, you know what i mean like just that's one of the things where you know a lot of things that i've talked about today is not in our job description but it can be in our wheelhouse i right. would not that i would not put trying to figure out the penalty part of it in your wheelhouse i would i would defer that to social security 100 percent of the time okay um, Great. Again, we want to we want to build our re reputation, and we want to come across as all knowing, uh, in in almost every aspect. This is not one of those that you want to put your reputation against, because chances are you're going to be wrong. Um, unfortunately, right. I don't think, plus on Part D, I don't think it's a big penalty because I have it. I didn't yeah. do Part D on Medicare. It's four dollars a month. And I didn't have it for a long time, <laughs> but anyway, so I don't think it'll be a big deal for him, but I will do that. I'll first do it through social security, get all the data and then do it. Gotcha. Thank you. Absolutely. What other questions do we have? What is the best way to, uh, if you're already licensed in say Florida, but you have prospects in another state, what is the best way to go about getting your license in that other state as well? So what I do for uh, my non-resident license, I just go through Nipper. Okay. Um, apply for a non-resident license. Okay. And then um, you should have it. I would say within two days, it, it doesn't take very long. Once you have that, you're good to go. And then um, what you'll want to do is reach back out to, to Shane mm -hmm. and let him know that you need to have access to market in multiple states. Um, okay, because you're I, I have my Washington license for my regular health, life, and annuity, but okay. I haven't gotten my is that, would that work with Medicare license as well? 
So Medicare, the only the only downside to Medicare is um, wherever you're going to market, you have to be licensed. So if you're going right. to sell um, a Florida policy, you can be in the state of Washington doing it over the phone. However, wherever the client is, you have to be licensed in that area. Um, the uh, the carrier, so for example, Humana, United, whoever, they also have to um, their training has to reflect that. So, so I have to I be, have to buy a new I have to buy the transfer I have to I have to buy the out of state license again for specifically Medicare. Well, Correct? if you have. So I, I don't know what the Washington state looks like, but Florida, they have life, health, and variable annuities into one license, 215, yeah. right? So yeah. if you have that same license, that's fine. Um, that will transfer over uh, just in a non-resident, right? So if you've got a non-resident, how am I trying to say this? If you just have your, your license in... Uh, Washington, mm -hmm. you would need a non-resident for Florida, and you need that non-resident. Well, I have uh, I have the resident the in Florida. I'm a resident Floridian, okay. and I got my equivalent in Washington as a non-resident license. Okay, through through my two. So now from that point, perfect. So from that point, now you just need to reach back out to Shane. And say, hey, Shane, I want to market in that area as well. If there's okay. an, any additional, so, so what you'll find is sometimes there's additional certifications you have to do, but okay. the carrier that you go through has to have you appointed in that, in that state. I follow. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I get it. I'll reach out to Shane. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions we have out there? Okay, we're getting pretty close to the end of this call. So let me just um, reflect on what we have inside of the LBA website so that you guys can go there. There's, there are resources for you guys, especially if you're newer to the call. Uh, my four page uh, system to be able to analyze the client, uh, teach them uh, the educational side, which is page one that is posted there, page two and three which is the financial analysis is there uh, as far as what they would spend on their health care. And then page four, which covers drugs is there as well. Um, every state that has a Medicaid uh, or, or state assistance program is posted up there right now. This PowerPoint is posted there as well as last week's. And I believe uh, Every other PowerPoint that I've done is also posted there. So if you guys have any uh, questions about any of the sales system, um, any of that stuff, any of the resources, marketing strategies, tips, uh, the Medicaid, all that stuff is already posted inside of the LBA website. All you have to do is go into the resources and click the media tab and then go into making the sale. If you do that, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff that's there. Outside of that, if you guys need any help uh, with a specific sale, I know there's been a couple of you already that's reached out to me directly when you're working with a client. It's not a problem. Give me a call. My mobile number, which I'm going to put in the chat here, is available for you guys. If I'm not actively engaged in another conversation, I will answer. But that is my mobile number. Um, and I have one other question. If really. you have a specific situation. Okay, go ahead. Oh, might be a dumb question, but someone had told me that you can write a policy on yourself. Is that true? Absolutely. Oh, you can? Oh, good. Absolutely. Why would you not? <laughs> well, I was told by one of the carriers that you couldn't, but that might have been more of a captive person as opposed to us. I don't know. That's that's possible. Yeah, you, you know, I I found I, I was talking to a gentleman earlier this week, and he was he was asking me, um, you know, what's what's the benefit of being an agent like what we have in LBA, which is um, 
uh, what we would consider an independent agent versus being a captive agent or an agent that works for a, a call center. And I'm like, well, here's the thing. For one, we don't have to follow the rules of the companies. Uh, I'm not talking about the Humanas, Uniteds. We have to follow those rules, but we don't have to follow the rules of ABC um, call center, uh, which is going to mean I, I get all my commission. I get all my renewals, which is really the best part of Medicare. And I can I don't have to not write business for this particular thing. I don't have to push this one product. I can just do what's right for my client. And really, if you've been in the industry any period of time, you'll realize the power in that. Um, from the financial standpoint and the freedom standpoint of things, because what we do is we change people's lives in Medicare. It may not seem that way from, from just the surface level, but as you really start helping people, and especially when you start getting into Medicaid and SNAP and, and helping them with things that actually put food on the table where it would not be, um, we make a huge difference in people's lives. And if we can do that through their health care or through some of the other things that we can put in our wheelhouse, uh, we've done a great thing. So, um, yes, to answer your question <laughs> very briefly, uh, you can write a policy on yourself uh, because you don't have any of the silly rules attached to, uh, to you through LBA. Okay. okay. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and close up. Um, Tons of resources on the LBA website. Uh, if you have any questions outside of that, please feel free to reach out to me. And if you, you. are an agency uh, leader of any capacity and you need me to do a specific training for your group, um, outside of Zoe's group, because I'm already working with her, um, let me know. Uh, send me an email or shoot me a text or, or give me a call. Outside of that, guys, have a great uh rest of your week and go help some folks we'll talk to you soon thanks